Hello, I am Renato Ambrosio from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, and I'm very happy and grateful to participating in the Shanghai Refractive Meeting. And I uh, am honored to accept the invitation from Professor Xingao Zhou. And my talk is going to be related to multimodal refractive imaging in refractive surgery, the what's, the why's, and the how's. Of course, this is uh, a, a talk that I have some financial disclosures, including the group brain, my master class, and of course, Oculus. When we think about refractive surgery, we evolved from a subspecialty medicine with elective procedures for refractive correction, in which the goal is not only to have a refraction corrected, but the goal is to have patient satisfaction with quality of vision and quality of life. But we most importantly evolved to the understanding that this is specialty in medicine. It's a specialty medicine with a refractive college, the World College of Refractive Surgery and Vision Sciences that is connected to the ISRS and the Refractive Surgery Alliance. So it's important that we understand that refractive surgery is not only laser vision correction on the cornea, is not only laser vision correction and fake KOLs and corneal therapeutic procedures with cross-linking and intracorneal rings, but we also talk about refractive cataract surgery. And in one word, what makes refractive cataract surgery is refractive planning with multimodal imaging and understanding the options for customization. We, of course, talk about laser vision correction. If the case is a better candidate for SMILE, for LASIK, for PRK, if the patient is a better candidate for intraocular IOLs, like fake IOLs and refractive cataract surgery, or if the patient is a therapeutic elective or elective procedure. Evolved uh, the evolution in refractive surgery in Brazil started in the 80s, and this is my past father, Renato Ambrosio, with his colleague, Dr. Carlos Andrade, along with Ricardo Guimarães, who started the, the science on the refractive surgery, the knowledge, and the Brazilian Society of Cataract and Refractive Surgery is very important, the connection of cataract along with corneal laser vision correction today. Uh, in a very nice discussion at the AO a couple of years ago, Guy Kazirin and uh, our cataract coach, Dr. Boudet, they talk about the future of refractive surgery for being intraocular. And I think it's not going to be to replace corneal laser vision correction, but of course, to add, and we need to understand this functional lens syndrome as Dr. Dury has taught us. Uh, I have helped a couple of theses on the mentorship for my colleague and friend, Dr. Jorge Neto, and he has, is talking about the lens dysfunction, a very nice evolution on the concept that was described by Dr. Dury and also George Boring IV. In the early stage, we have early presbyopia, which is kind of where I am right now, but it evolves to severe loss of accommodation and then to mild cataract with loss of cataract. Uh, related this is correct vision is going to be the second step. But here we have loss of contrast and understanding that here in the fourth and fifth stages, it's easy to indicate cataract surgery, but between two and three is when we have to be keen on the understanding if the patient's a better candidate for cornea or refractive cataract surgery. The technology can help us like with the grading from shine food imaging, but also when we integrate multimodal imaging, like with the intraocular aberrations, for example, the eye trace has the, the lens dysfunction index that we can correlate with the shine fluke imaging and also with the phacodynamics dynamics in a nice thesis by my colleague from Portugal, Fernando Faria Correa. So when we talk about diagnostics in refractive surgery, we need to understand what we're looking for. And I'm honored to talk about ancient wisdom from China in this great meeting that in the art of war, we have to understand ourselves and we have to understand the enemy so that we can win the battles. The battles are the what's, understanding how to customize, how to optimize the planning. If you do surgery in the cornea, if you do fake IOL, if you do a cataract surgery with a refractive goal, if this is a therapeutic or refractive, if the cornea surgery is, a, is the best approach, if you do laser vision correction with smile, LASIK, or advanced surface ablation. Of course, we want to prevent complications and the leading one is progressive ectasia, but the most common one is tear dysfunction uh, and ocular pain is a very important situation as well. We have other situations like appetitization of the interface, the smile, quality of vision related symptoms, and all of these complications and all this planning can be optimized with multimodal imaging, starting from anamnesis, slit lamp, corneal thickness analysis, 
front surface topography along with aqua surface imaging is very important. Shine fluke tomography, OCT with segmental tomography, aqua biometry, evaluation of the corneal uh, and total corneal uh, aberrations and the integrated wavefront and ocular scattering, corneal biomechanics, cell evaluation for confocal and spectral microscopy, and more and more in the future, we have genetics and molecular biology. So those are the hows. We have to understand post-lasic ectasia is a conundrum with more than 20 years of history. When you think about ectasia, we have to understand that screen for ectasia risk prior to laser vision correction is not the same thing as when we manage patients with keratoconus prior to keratoplasty. We broke paradigms but created some paradoxes related to this uh, options that we have with cross-link and intracorneal uh, uh, the segment uh, rings, for example. So the goal is important. We have to understand how to apply the data and artificial intelligence along with ancient intelligence are fundamental. And this is the algorithm I created, HUI squared. We have to understand the characterization of susceptibility, which is what we have to aim for when we screen laser vision correction is different than when we diagnose, stage, prognose, classify, and do the follow-up and customize the best approach for cure to cone patients. So this is a true revolution in evolution. So this algorithm, HUI square, we have to be very mindful about this, how to understand and how to apply artificial intelligence. For example, is ectasia important before cataract surgery? It is because it has an impact on the accuracy of the IOL power calculation. It's also going to be important for the quality of vision if you use diffractive or any type of uh, optics that will the, decrease the, the, the amount of energy that reaches the retina. And of course, it will be safely impacting the safety of laser vision correction secondary to cataract surgery. So we need to understand if the patient has mild keratoconus or subclinical keratoconus or susceptible cornea or a fruit keratoconus, whatever you want to call. You need to do this because this is a patient that was very nicely operated. The patient had a multifocal toric IOL very motivated for seeing distance and, and, and near. He had some astigmatism, so the colleague did a perfect surgery with a perfect toric IOL implantation, but he did not look at the cornea properly. This patient has low K keratoconus in the topometric on the Scheinflug and also on the placida disc, you can see the TKC in the left eye, but it's very obvious when you look at the Scheinflug integrated imaging tomography and biomechanics, you have a TBI of one in both eyes. So it's a thin, thin, steep and, steep and cornea, but it's not a very steep cornea. If you understand, this is important to know before surgery. We changed the IOL for an aspheric IOL. The patient was very happy. Interestingly, we have to know when is not ectasia, where it's not keratoconus. This is a patient with anterior basement membrane dystrophy. And you see how easy it is to remove the epithelium. And this patient has a steep cornea, but a thick epithelium. And even though it's a little yellow on the D, on the belly and ambrosia here, with an elevation change, I think this patient does not have uh, very severe or abnormal biomechanics. And this is important that we understand how to use surface ablation for those cases. It's not for cure the cones. Interestingly, this goes in the understanding of the, uh, of the evolution of imaging that goes to the segmental tomography and the, the corneal OCT and anterior segment OCT revolution is, is coming to age. So we have to be keen on using this technology, but of course, looking at the data to understand the hows and the whys to apply this technology. This is a patient that came to me if back up about 10 years ago, 38 years old, she had uh, astigmatism, not corrected to 2020, and was intolerant to contact lens, and she was keen to do refractive surgery. If you change the scale, you see how the cornea would look like. This is unquestionably looking at the, 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 the shine fluke with the placido, with the whole eye away from data. This patient has unquestionable abnormalities. The, the D is abnormal in both eyes, and this patient has unquestionable mild keratoconus. So this patient with mild keratoconus and a thin cornea, she can have or not laser vision correction. And the diagnostics was uh, that the patient had mild keratoconus, uh, patient education about ectasia, cross-linking, hand refractive surgery. I don't do cross-linking as a prophylactic surgery, but I optimize the surface and advise against her rubbing, no question what, but we advised that she could do PRK and she knew to come back for follow-ups. We did a topo-guided 
surface ablation. She did very well. And a few years later, she comes back and she surprises me asking if she needs cross-linking. And of course, she was not, uh, she was very stable. She did not need any cross-linking. She gained vision and uh, she's stable on topography and tomography. And last follow-up, uh, about 10 years, almost 10 years after surgery, she was stable with a CBI post LDC that is very normal. And retrospectively, we look at the biomechanics and this TBI was not so bad. So we learned that this can be a predicted. Uh, when we understand, for example, another case with 23 years old with no family history of keratoconus, normal topography, very low corrections, this patient had everything normal on the orb scan, also on topography. The D was a little abnormal. When I saw this patient in a Zoom meeting, I say, I would wait because of age. The patient had PRK and PRK lead to ectasia in both eyes. Interestingly, the patient also had a biomechanical analysis that could be retrospectively calculated, the, the, the TBI V1 and V2. And this is a very interesting anecdote of uh, the demonstration of ectasia susceptibility. So when we think about laser vision correction, we have to think about the impact from surgery and the TBI is my way of understanding if the patient is a good candidate for LASIK, smile, or surface ablation. And of course, if the patient is a good candidate for fake KOL. So understanding the refractive technologies that we have for diagnosis is going to be keen for customizing, for enhancing safety, and also enhancing the, 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 the way that we can help our patients in the most efficient way and customized way as possible. So I'm honored to participate in this great meeting. I thank you very much for your kind attention and I look forward to collaborating with you soon. Thank you.